Um, would you uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Ron Thiebert? Thank you. Um, all right. So not everybody was too sick of hearing me talk. Um, let me just get out of this. So let's see. Okay. Slideshow. All right, good. Okay. Um, so, uh, so that was the kind of the whole big inclusive part. But um, this one, as you can guess from the title, is Seizures 101. So it's just, uh, we're going to talk about seizures. Um, and then the next talk is seizure treatment. So this one's just going to be seizures. Um, uh, and uh, so I guess we'll just start. Um, so this is the, the region of uh, chromosome 15 that's, um, uh, that's uh, you know, affected in Angelman syndrome. and. Um, uh, I don't understand most of it myself, so. Um, but what I do understand is that the, the gene in the middle, UBE3A, that's the main gene that causes the symptoms of Angelman syndrome. But what we also see is, um, the, if you look down at the bottom, where the, the, not the last two, but the other ones where it says GA, BRB, and there's three different ones, those are GABA receptor genes. So GABA is, um, is a chemical in the brain that kind of helps slow things down. So um, GABA really helps with um, stopping seizures because that's, you know, it's a balance of getting things too excited versus too kind of calm down. GABA is one of the things that does the calming. Um, so it really helps with seizures. Um, GABA is a big uh, component of the sleep cycle. And, um, and it's also involved with anxiety. So you can see where when it's not um, mediated right, you know, you get those symptoms. So, um, so it, it's, it's not just the UBE3 gene, the UBE3A gene that we're dealing with. Um, kids with deletions, um, and actually, actually all the kids, um, except for the kids with the UBE3A mutations, tend to have the GABA genes affected as well. So there's a couple different things at play, and as we learned in the scientific convention yesterday, they're actually working on mice um, uh, that produce melatonin. So melatonin transmission also in production seems to be a little bit off. So there's, there's definitely, um, uh, you know, um, chemical reasons for sleep as well as seizures, but but GABA, uh, not, uh, in addition to anxiety and sleep, it's um, it definitely affects seizures too, I think. And so, um, so in Angelman syndrome, so those of you who are here probably saw these two slides. Um, uh, you know, the manifestations of Angelman syndrome are typically neurologic, psychiatric. It's uh, the, the abnormal, the UBE3A gene, it's, it's expressed abnormally just in the brain. So that's why you don't get heart issues, lung issues, um, that kind of stuff. So the main things we see are epilepsy, sleep disturbance, uh, developmental delays, movement disorders, um, anxiety and difficult behaviors, GI dysfunction. and. Um, a big piece of GI dysfunction is the, the nerves all go into the belly. There's the outside of the brain. There's the, the most nerve tissue in the body is in the is in the belly. So there's a big um, uh, neurologic component to, to GI stuff. And then also behavior is a big piece of GI stuff. Um, not eating the best foods, not drinking enough. So um, even though it's even though it's a different set of organs, it's really you know the brain kind of affecting it. And then orthopedic and ophthalmologic. So um, when you have uh, neurological issues, you have kind of uh, issues with tone, mobility, so um, that can lead to problems with your spine, your hips, um, that kind of thing. So in our clinic at Mass General, we, we have the specialists that, um, that treat those, those issues, so neurology, genetics, psychiatry, neuropsychology, sleep medicine, um, GI, and then consults as needed to orthopedics and ophthalmology. Um, so uh, our clinic, so we opened in 2008. Um, uh, we have seen 170 families so far um, from all over the U.S. and Canada. We've also seen families from Russia, from South America, um, and that is that is us. And so, um, so getting into the actual epilepsy itself, uh, it, epilepsy occurs in about one to two percent of all kids um, anywhere, no matter what the no matter what the genetic issue, no genetic issue, just all kids anywhere. It's one to two percent, um, and that's that's you know. That's like I said, it was my day job. That's kind of I'm an epileptologist, so that's what we do is we treat kids with seizures, and um, and it doesn't sound like a lot, but one percent is really a lot of people, and it keeps us very busy. Um, and epilepsy, in fact, is the most common neurological problem in childhood um, worldwide. And so one of the one of the things that's confusing are the definitions, and they change them all the time. And you know, what's a seizure? What's epilepsy? What's a seizure syndrome? What's Lennox Gastaut? What's you know the the and and they, they're going to change it again this year, I'm sure. So. As of now, what the definition is, so epilepsy is defined as, um, well, it always has been defined as two or more unprovoked seizures, so seizures that didn't 
weren't caused by having meningitis or getting hit in the head or whatever, just, just having two or more seizures. So if, if you have one seizure, it's a seizure. If you have two seizures, it's officially epilepsy. So that's all epilepsy is, is two or more seizures. Because um, some people say, we don't have epilepsy, we have a seizure disorder, but if you've had more than one seizure, you have epilepsy. So that's, that's, what, um, that's what that term means. Um, and then they, they just recently, of course, changed the definition, so it's a new definition. It's, um, they now say if you have one seizure but your EEG is abnormal, then it's, it can be epilepsy. So, um, uh, so that's kind of the new thing. So seizure types. So there's seizure types, there's seizure syndromes, and sometimes it gets confusing because um, someone will say, well, you know, my daughter has head drops, but then someone told her she had Lennox Gasto, and what is it? And so there's, there's, there's seizure types and there's, there's epilepsy syndrome. So a seizure type is just exactly like what is, what is that type of seizure? You have a seizure, what is it? Is it a head drop? Is it a focal? Is it? And I'll talk about all the different types. But an epilepsy syndrome is, is, a, is a gathering of, of seizure types, of EEG findings, and of cognitive functioning. So when you talk about epilepsy syndromes like Lennox Gasto or West syndrome or any of these different syndromes, they, um, it, it's, it's the seizures, it's the EEG, and it's the clinical piece. So you have your seizure types, but then you can wrap those types up with EEG findings and other stuff and have a syndrome. So th th that gets confusing if, um, if, you don't, if, if you're not familiar with all the terminology. So what are the types? So there's two different categories of seizure. There's focal seizure, um, and then there's generalized seizure. So a focal seizure is, um, uh, is a seizure that arises just from one part of the brain. So it starts either in the frontal lobe or in the occipital lobe. So it starts in one part of the brain, and it can, um, it can stay there and it give you some type of symptoms where it can spread. Um, and we'll talk more about that. And then generalized seizures arise from the whole brain at once. So it's probably coming from some circuit where the, it's coming from, down from deeper and going to the whole brain at once. And that's what's really disrupted, not just the whole brain itself, but those, those kind of weird circuits and stuff. So, um, so your seizures can be focal or they can be generalized. In an Angelman syndrome, most seizures are generalized. They're generalized seizure types. But you can have focal seizures, which is confusing. Um, so that's what, a, that's what a generalized seizure looks like. So if you look at the, uh, look at the EEG, um, you can see that the, the spikes are kind of in the whole, they're, they're bigger in parts and smaller in others, but you can see the whole brain is affected. That's what a generalized seizure looks like. Um, so focal seizures, um, getting back to those, they, they come from one or, or more parts of the brain. You can have focal, so they all come from the temporal lobe, or they can be multifocal. They come from this part, that part, this part. And the symptoms you get uh, depend on what part of the brain it's coming from. So if it's coming from the kind of the central area uh, here, you're going to get shaking. You're going to get you're going to get shaking of the hand, the arm, the face, because um, that's where the motor part of the brain is. If it's coming from the back of the brain where your vision is, you could get kind of strange visual hallucinations. Um, if it's coming from uh, the front part of the brain. Um, you know, it'll spread back to where the motor areas. The, the temporal lobes over the ears can give you like a weird nauseous feeling. So people just kind of look weird. They'll look out of it. They'll look like something's kind of not going on. Those people that can talk will say that they have a feeling they can't describe or they smell something funny and then they, they have their seizure. Um, so the focal seizures kind of come from one part of the, of, of the brain. And, and it's often hard to see them if there's no, if there's no actual movements. But, um, uh, you know, a lot of times kids will just stop and stare and everyone thinks it's an absence, which we'll talk about. But so with some focal seizures, that's all you get. It'll just be like a temporal lobe seizure coming from the back of the brain. And, and you can just get that staring. So staring is, can be an absence and be generalized, but it can be focal as well, if that's not too confusing. Um, but, uh, but the most common type of focal seizures, which are clearly focal, is when you just have one side of the face, one arm or one leg, and that's either clenching or it's shaking and it's just one side. That's, 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 those are the ones that you really know are focal seizures. Um, they used to call them uh, partial seizures. So if you're partial, that's the same thing, but the old term, because they keep changing it. So they used to be called partial and they used to be called simple partial or complex partial. Now they call them focal discognitive. So it, it, they change the terms all the time to make it more confusing, but the focal seizures come from part of the brain. That's the main thing. And that's kind of what it looks like. It's, um, uh, I can't really point that well, but if you look at that very top line, you can see it's really spiky and kind of rhythmic and crazy and the rest of the brain looks um, different. So it's just, it's just seizure coming from just that one little piece of the brain. Um, and then the generalized seizure type. So um, the most, most seizure types in angel syndrome are generalized. So generalized tonic-clonic, um, atonic, myoclonic, absence, tonic, and spasm. So I will talk about them individually, so I won't go into them now. So um, generalized tonic-clonic is, is what a lot of people call grand mal seizures. So um, the, the, the fancy name is generalized tonic-clonic. 
And um, so those can begin in one part of the brain and spread. So that's called like a secondary, secondarily generalized. They start in one place and they move. Or they can just be generalized tonic-clonic to start with. Um, the reason they call it tonic-clonic is tonic is stiffening and clonic is shaking. And um, nobody wants to watch seizures. But if you really do kind of stop and watch, you'll see stiffening first and then the shaking. So it's, that's why they call it a tonic-clonic. There's, there's an initial kind of stiff part and then, and then the shaking. So so tonic clonic is, is what they call it and then post that's the that's the um, that's the uh, um, the kind of the time after the seizure's over so you have the seizure then you're what we call post which is um, usually tired confused often kids will nap and these big ones where there's lots of shaking they're really exhausting so most kids will fall asleep after a tonic clonic seizure um, then the next one is atonic so um, atonic means uh, kind of the definition is like a meaning no and tonic meaning tone so no tone that's a just a, just a loss of tone so it's a drop seizure so um it can be the most common are head drops so people sitting there their head just kind of drops like that and um uh and they usually look a little bit stunned for a second or two so it, it can be hard because sometimes kids will just kind of look down there they see something interesting they look down but it's when they when the head drops and then they just kind of look confused and pick it back up slowly that's that's a classic that's a classic drop seizure an atonic seizure um so we get a lot of videos you know is this a seizure and, it's, and often it's no it's just looking down at something but you know when you know you can when it's really a quick drop and then a minute of confu a second of confusion and then back to what they were doing that's that's classic for a, for an atonic seizure a head drop and they can come in clusters so if you see a bunch in a row a little bit out of it and then nothing for a while that's, that's probably a cluster of atonic seizures um and then so myoclonic seizures i talked a little bit about in the last uh talk for those who were here but it's a very fast brief contraction of muscles um kids are typically super you know, like uh, awake when, when that happens but um and they could even be provoked by startles by loud noises by flashing lights so um like a, uh, so like I was talking about, if you, if you fall asleep and you feel your head kind of bob like that, or you get that, you, everyone has that thing where you, as you fall asleep, you feel like you're falling off a cliff and you shake and you wake up. It's um, those those are myoclonic jerks. So that's those are normal in sleep. We all have them. But when you see those in a in a child who's awake and just doing their normal thing, and they just have a big jerk out of the middle of nowhere. That's that's what a myoclonic seizure looks like. It's just a big. It's like a big jump. It's like, it almost looks like a startle in some ways. Um, so that's a myoclonic seizure. Um, an absent seizure, so again, these can be kind of tough sometimes to differentiate between focal, but, and these to be called petite mal, so the big, the tonic clonics were called grandma, these are called petite mal's. Um, they've gotten away from using those terms, but uh, it's um, kind of an abrupt loss of consciousness um, and then and an ending, so, uh, and the best way to really, and it's, these are, these can be tough because, um, a lot of kids just stare off. They're just bored. They're, they don't want to do something. They don't want to do the therapy. They'll just stare. So, you know, is it a seizure? It's, it, it's not always easy to know. The best way to determine is it a seizure, if, is, is it, does it interrupt a preferred activity? So they're doing something really fun that they like, and they're playing, and they're playing, and they're doing something, and they stop, and they stare, and they go back to it. That's probably more likely to be an absent seizure because, um, you know, but if you're, like, telling them, you know, it's, it's time to get up and put that away, and they just stare off, they're just ignoring you. So it's, um, you know, if, if it happens during those times, it's not so worrisome. But when they're really doing something they're enjoying or they're really focusing on, and they, and they stop, and they start up again, um, that's more concerning and and if it's if they're first time seizures if someone's never had a seizure before um uh, kind of a, a helpful clue it's not 100 percent, but if things are a little bit off you know you're starting to see these staring spells that look a little bit different but um you know they're just not quite as communicative they're not quite as balanced they're not quite as just making as much eye contact um you know that that's often a sign that these are probably seizures because when the eg changes and the seizures start you can see a little bit of change in um in development and how things are going um which then gets better when when the seizures get better but um you know if it's if you're if you're thinking about first time seizures that's that's a that's a that's a helpful clue like if everything looks great and they're doing awesome and they're having a little bit of staring here and there it's not, not that they're not seizures, but they're less likely to be seizures. Um, whereas if things just don't look right and you're seeing staring, that's that's more of a red flag that something's really going on. Um, so really, you know, how is how is life in general um, around these little staring events, and when do they happen? Those are big clues as to whether they're seizures or not. And if there's any questions, always best just to just call your doctor and say, what do you think these are? And then you know, if there's any concern, then you come in, you get the EG, the whole bit. But um, but those are those are kind of the some kind of little tips on, on when, when to worry, when not to worry. And there's two different types. The kids with angiomen have atypical absence as opposed to typical absence, and they, they can be a little bit longer, so kind of a typical absence seizure lasts a few seconds, and it's really dramatic. They just stop, they stare, they're not there, and they come right back to where they were. But atypical can last a little bit longer. They can, be, they can still do some things while it's happening. They're not 100% out. They're just kind of altered as opposed to out. So um, 
so in angel it's they're the atypical is what is what we see so it's a little bit a little bit different um, and then tonic seizures are rare in angel syndrome which is good um, it's whole body stiffening so it's not uh, not so much you know the tonic clonic really stiffen and shake but it's just it's just really stiffening and and um, and uh, the, and what they look like on EEG is this so I know that's probably foreign to a lot of people but you can see where they you have what looks like EEG stuff, then it gets flat, then you see more EEG stuff. And, and so tonic seizures plus the next one, spasms, those are the two uh, seizure types on EEG where the EEG kind of flattens for several seconds. And those are, those are tougher. Those are tougher to treat. They're tougher to, um, tougher to manage. They, they usually come along with much more severe cognitive issues. Um, luckily, in Angelman syndrome, both are rare. We don't see very many tonic seizures or spasms at all. They're not impossible, they're not zero, but they're super rare. The main types of seizures we see are the ones that are um, not as, as difficult. You don't see the EG flat, not like that. They're, they're the absences, the myoclonics, the focal, the, the tonic clonics. So, um, but these, so these aren't impossible. But infantile, so spasms, you can see at any age. Um, uh, a lot of people probably heard of infantile spasms. The difference between infantile spasms versus epileptic spasms is that they're just an infant. So, I mean, it's just, you know, but, but that's the most common time to have them. And they're, they're clusters of quick spasms where the, the arms come out and the head goes forward. Um, almost like a, they call them like, like a jackknife sometimes, like the head goes up and it comes, and they come in big clusters. And, um, and those are typically associated with lots of developmental regression and, and, and bad things. And there are case reports in Angel, but I've never seen it. Um, and I hope not to, but so, but it can happen. They're rare, but it's um, uh, luckily it's not a big thing that we deal with. But in in babies, so under a year, um, something to watch for. You know you, those those quick. Um, typically, you'll you're more likely to see a head drop than a spasm. And the difference is, if you're seeing head drops, what differentiates that from a spasm is that that you, you kind of watch the arms. And if the arms are nice and quiet, and it's just the head going down, that's an atonic seizure, uh, which is better. If if the head goes down, and the arms come up then that's more likely to be a spasm. Um, but anyway, if you see head drops, you always call your doctor, you know, head drops, and then they'll help you figure out are these spasms, are they, are they head drops? Um, but that's, um, but, uh, so that, that's another seizure type, which we don't see much, but, and same thing with the EEG. Very normal EEG, then a quick one second flattening, that's, that's where the spasm happens, then it goes back. Um, so an epilepsy syndrome, so those are the seizure types, and the syndromes are, the seizure type, the EEG finding, and the the cognitive piece, and um, uh, so that it's it's kind of all wrapped into one. There's 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 two seizure types. I mean seizures. I say no, I'm getting it wrong. Two epilepsy syndromes that we see in Angelman syndrome in, in some kids. One is uh, it's called Lennox Gastaut syndrome, and one is called uh, myoclonic status in non-progressive encephalopathies, which is a long a long name, but um, a, a newer a newer class of seizure. So Lennox Gastaut syndrome. It's um, it's confusing because you know we've actually had people say, well, you know, someone told us that we had Angelman syndrome, but someone else said we had Lennox Gastaut syndrome. You, you know, you can so you can have both. The the syndromes just describe the type of epilepsy that, that's going on. So, um, so it's basically three categories to, to officially call it Lennox Gastaut syndrome. It's intractable seizures of mixed types. So the main types are atonic, tonic, atypical, absent. So those are, um, but the you know, the, like I said, the tonic is more rare in Angelman syndrome. You can also have myoclonic, generalized tonic, clonic, or focal. So, so multiple types, not just one, but two or more types of seizures that are refractory to medicine. You tried two or more medicines, they didn't work. Um, EEG findings of generalized slow spike in wave, um, which is uh, kind of the common epileptic finding in Angelman syndrome. You have, uh, I went back to the generalized slide, you have, um, you know, the whole brain kind of going at once and, and the what's, you know, slow spike in wave versus regular spike in wave is less than three hertz. So you have two and a half or less of those per second is all that means. So it's just kind of nerdy, nerdy neurology stuff. And then, um, and then cognitive dysfunction. So if there's developmental delay, so you have developmental delay, you have those EEG findings and you have multiple seizure types of, um, uh, that, that don't respond well to the first couple of medicines. Then it's technically Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. So um, a fair amount of cases with Angelman syndrome do qualify as Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, and, and that doesn't change anything, whether it's Lennox-Gastaut, whether it's not. You treat it the same way, um, you know, it gets better to the same medicines. If you have one, one little guy that has just one seizure type, one that has multiple, and they both get better with Keppra, then, then that's what it is. You, you, they're, they're both better. It doesn't really matter. It's just, it's just a way of classifying the seizure type. So if someone says, well, we think it's Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, you don't say, well, okay, that's you know, it's the end of the world now. It's, it's, no, nothing's changed. It's just a way to describe it. So if you hear that term, it doesn't really change much. It's just a way we talk about it. And one of the things it can do is it can get you into some trials, like, like the CBD trials for Lennox-Gastaut now. So um, that's how we're kind of sneaking some Angelman kids into that trial, hopefully. Um, and then the other one is um, myoclonic status and non-progressive encephalopathies. It's rare. Um, it's, uh, I talked a little bit about this morning. It's when 
Um, I'll talk about non-convulsive status, but when your EEG gets uh, just very abnormal consistently and you see a, de a decline in skills, you see less eye contact, less, um, less uh, communication, less, um, you know, immersing of motor skills, just everything kind of goes downhill and there's kind of constant twitching. Um, so different from uh, what we were talking about before with the, you know, with the adults and the myoclonus, this is um, kind of this long bouts of myoclonus with with a clear decrease and decline in, in, um, in abilities. And so it's really rare. There's been a couple, like a hundred or a couple hundred um, uh, cases reported. There's a study that came out in 2007, 2008 that talked about all these cases, but 40% of the cases had Angelman syndrome. So it's not common, but um, one of the biggest, uh, probably the biggest um, contributor to the cases that have been reported is Angelman syndrome. And I've seen, I think two um, out of the hundred. And so, I mean, it's, it's not common, um, but it, it's, it's tough and it needs to be, um, recognized and, and treated if it's there. Um, so status epilepticus, so luckily this isn't super common. It does happen in Angelman syndrome, but it's not as common as, as other syndromes or other, um, other types of epilepsies that we see. The, uh, it's, so they ch another thing, they change the definition all the time. So it used to be seizures lasting more than half an hour, then it was seizures more than 15 minutes. Now we often say, okay, it's more than five minutes. But the, um, the reason we use five minutes is that most seizures should stop within two to three minutes. That's just kind of, you know, the brain's kind of programmed to, to protect itself and, and to stop seizing after a certain amount of time. So the, the magic number, so, uh, you know, if anyone has diastat, um, you know, they say, okay, give it after five minutes. It, it, you don't give it after five minutes because bad things are gonna happen to your brain after five minutes. And if you don't get the diastat at the five minute mark, then you know, you're gonna have all this, these dead brain cells. That's not, that's not at all the case. The reason we say five minutes is because it should have stopped at three. So if it's still going at five, that's time to treat because if it goes five, is it going to go 10? Is it going to go 30? So that's, that's the magic number for five minutes. And so as we get to know kids and as we get a sense of what their seizure patterns are like, we can always change that number. If someone always has a six minute seizure, we may say do it at seven minutes because we know it's going to stop at six. If we know that if someone has a seizure at all, it's going to go 20, we say give it at one, you know, because we just know it's going to go 20 minutes. So that you can tailor that to in each individual child because they're all different. But um, the reason we always, the, the initial diet that's always, you know, give for seizure after five minutes is because it should be, it should be done. And if it's not, then, then it's time to treat it. So, um, but there's, there's nothing scary. You know, I know people, I I've had some people that have been really scared. They said, well, I had a six-minute seizure. We're afraid he's got brain damage. And that's, that's not the case. There's no, there's no magic number as far as what happens to you after five minutes. It's just that's when you, you really should start to treat it. I mean, to really have, I mean, to have a, a convulsive seizure to really cause any sort of damage or any sort of long-term issues, seizures usually have to be an hour, an hour and a half, two hours. I mean, we're talking long seizures. But, um, but you always want to treat as early as possible to, A, avoid that, but B, to avoid, um, you know, biting your lip, choking, you know, it's for safety issues, we try to treat the seizure as early as possible. But if you do happen to have a seizure that goes a little bit longer than that, um, you know, it's, it's not too much to worry about because, you know, the brain is, the brain's hardy and it, and it, and it can handle that for, for a while. Um, so non-convulsive status, um, uh, probably something that a lot of people have heard about. What non-convulsive status is, is, um, I know this is kind of a tricky concept, but it's not so much of a seizure as it's like an epileptic encephalopathy, which probably makes no sense. But what we what we see is, you know, when you have when you have status, when you have um, convulsive status, and you're you're either kind of in just like in an, in an absence seizure for forever, or for you're just kind of shaking forever, just kind of going on and on. That's that's kind of obvious. What non-convulsive status is is that you kids still do what they do. They still run around and play and drink and eat, but they don't do it as well. They, you know, you see it, it kind of happens pretty quick, but it's uh, a loss of, of, of skills. The, the eye contact goes away, the balance gets worse. Things just kind of slowly, just over a day, two days, a week, just kind of go down, down, down. And so th it's not technically a seizure, but it's, it's an epileptic process. So, um, and when you see in the, I'll go back to it, but the EEG kind of looks like that. I um, actually have better examples, but it's just kind of constantly spiking. There's just spike, 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 spike. Um, uh, it's, um, you know, so you, like I said, you see the decreased alertness. Um, it can last for weeks to, you know, days to weeks. Um, uh, the, the main thing to remember with this is that Angelman syndrome is not a regressive type of uh, thing you know, lots of kids that we see in the world of neurology, we just know they get worse over time. You know, they're uh, you know, Rett syndrome is one, some of the metabolic stuff. Uh, you know, kids start off a certain way and they get worse and worse and worse. And we don't think that that's what happens in Angelman syndrome. In fact, we're pretty sure that doesn't happen. So anytime things go backwards, there's a reason. And the question is, what's that reason? And it could be as easy as, 
they're just super anxious and they're just kind of not doing what they're supposed to be doing. It could be that they're in pain, their belly hurts, and they're just kind of acting out. It could be they're not sleeping great, but it could be this. So that's always something to think about is, um, uh, you know, if they're having a bad day, you know, we say it's, it's a bad day to see what, what tomorrow's like, but if it becomes two bad days, three bad days, things are just kind of worsening, especially if it's after an illness or something that could have really um, triggered an episode, uh, you know, it's always something to think about. And it's always something to, you know, we want to call your doctor about if you think that it's been, you know, a day, two days. If, if you just see that things aren't right, you know, always just kind of check in and see because the, the quicker you, you can treat this, the, um, the, uh, the better. Um, and uh, oh, sorry, I'll talk about treatment next. I was going to say, where's my treatment slide? But that's next hour is the treatment slide. But, um, but non so it's been reported as high as 50%, some studies 90%. But I think a, a lot of that is that in a lot of those studies, they weren't on the right medicines. In, in the kids that we see, I don't think I put a slide in, but um, uh, you know, we, we, we probably see maybe 10%, 12%. So it's, um, it's a lot, I think if you treat the seizures well with the right medicines and stay on top of them, um, you know, this is still going to happen. It's still part of the syndrome, but uh, I think the odds are a lot less. Um, and it's all about kind of maintenance. You know, the better things are on a daily basis, the less likely something like this is to happen. It, it's still, it's it's always out there. It's always a possibility. Um, it happens to a lot of kids. Even kids are doing great. They can just be doing awesome for months and then boom. So always keep an eye out. But um, but uh, I, I don't think the incidence is quite as high as it's reported. Um, and and the, the more you can do to keep seizures down, to keep sleep better, to keep GI better, um, the less likely you are to have a non-convulsive episode. But there's things you can't help. You go on vacation, you don't sleep well, they come home sick, and then that's, you know, that, that's, that's kind of a, a time where things might happen. So um, you still have, to, still have to live life, but the, um, you know, the, the, just from, on a day-to-day -day basis, the better you can kind of keep everything regulated, the less likely. Um, so in general, in Angelman syndrome, it's um, we talked about general and focal. It's a generalized epilepsy. So, um, you know, the, the main types are um, tonic, clonic, absence, atonic, and myoclonic. Um, like I said, tonic seizures and spasms are, are rare, but not impossible. And then, um, uh, but even though it's a generalized epilepsy, you can sometimes see focal seizures. So. Um, like in, in Lennox Gasto itself, which is kind of real broad, um, you know, it's a, it's a generalized epilepsy. The EG is generalized like it is in Angelman, um, no matter what the etiology is, but uh, you, you still have to treat it like a generalized epilepsy. You can't use medicines for focal seizures for a generalized epilepsy, which is, I know is confusing, but it's, um, you know, you can see focal seizures, but you still think of it as a generalized epilepsy. And then um, the study that we did, if for those of you here this morning, um, uh, we looked at, you know, we had a nice survey on, through the Angelman Foundation, 461 folks with, um, uh, were surveyed, and we found that 391 had seizures, so about an 86% rate of seizures. That's probably a little bit high, um, like I said, because the, uh, those who are filling out a seizure survey, you know, because we said even if you don't have them, please fill it out, but you're going to tend, more people with seizures are going to tend to fill them out than, than not, so the number's probably a little bit lower, but it's probably in that 80% range. And the, the seizure types that we had, um, the purple one is atonic, then generalized tonic, clonic, then absence, then um, at the time it was complex partial, now it's focal, it's focal discognitive. And then um, the, 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 the one that's lower, the purple one, that's myoclonic. But I think that was the way we wrote the, we wrote the survey that um, uh, it's, it's hard to differentiate myoclonus, a myoclonic seizure from a, from a clonic seizure from a, you know, so I, th I think it was just the way we wrote the survey. It, it really should be up in that same neighborhood. So those are the, those are the five main types. Um, and then broken down by um, by subtype uh, is kind of what what most most of the literature says. About 90% of kids with deletions will have seizures. Um, about 75% of the kids with UBE 3A or UPD, and about 50% of the kids with imprinting center defects. So, um, as with most things, kids with deletions tend to have have a more uh, more frequent seizures. Um, uh, they're more common, but it doesn't mean that they're always going to be tough. We have plenty of kids um, with deletions who are doing great seizure-wise. So um, even though the percentage is high, uh, it's not that 90% have bad seizures. 90% have seizures, and really a small, a, a pretty small percent have have tough seizures. Um, and then, um, so relative to age, um, kind of like I mentioned before, we see seizures kind of at their worst in, in early childhood, two, three, four, like two to six maybe is kind of the, the, the tough range. So they tend to kind of settle out on their own towards, um, towards puberty. Uh, we often see that being the best time. And then um, sometimes they'll either persist or come back after puberty, um, uh, especially for girls. Um, the, the hormonal change can be a big thing. Um, period start, you can, see a, you can see a worsening of the seizures again. But, but luckily, um, 
we see seizures in adults and only about a quarter of adults. And for most of them, it's um, they're, they're monthly or they're, or they're, or they're yearly. Um, I think, I don't think I have the data in here, but I think when we looked at, at, the, um, at the adult stuff from this morning, uh, it was like 10% of the adults, um, no, it was 10% of those that had seizures. So um, less than 10% of adults in general have real tough seizures. So it happens, but it's, 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 it's not common. Um, and then, so the EG and Angelman syndrome, um, it's a normal EEG, so uh, it's um, uh, every green line is a second, and so you see this kind of the you see little waves kind of get bigger as they go front to back. That's how it's arranged front to back, and um, and uh, uh, and you have depending on the age, but in older kids, um, you have like eight of those per second is uh, is what you want to see, um, and. Um, but in, um, in, in folks with Angelman syndrome, there's, uh, even without seizures, there's always some abnormalities on the EEG. And there's some different patterns that we see. So um, it, it's, it's not always easy to, you know, after you've seen thousands of them, like I have, you kind of get the hang of it a little bit. But the um, you know, kind of deciding what's just a normal Angelman pattern, what's a seizure, we've seen EEGs that were just a kind of a classic Angelman pattern that were called seizures. We've seen seizures that they said that's just Angelman. So it's, it's not always not as easy. When you see enough, you kind of get the hang of it. But it, it's it's hard, and um, the one of the one of the common patterns is called bifrontal spike in wave, so um, or frontal slow spike in wave. So you kind of see in the front of the. Uh, I don't have a point. Do I have a pointer? I think I have a pointer. Maybe I do. Oh, do I have a mouse? There we go. So kind of this stuff here. It, it's not it, like you go back to that generalized slide I showed. It was just a very clear spike in wave, spike in wave. This is kind of sloppy. It's mostly just waves with little tiny spikes mixed in here. It's just right in the front of the brain. So that we think that's more of a kind of a common Angelman pattern. Um, sometimes it's called notch delta. So delta just means that there's three bumps or less in a second. So it's this stuff. So it's this, this tall stuff. And you can see it's not like a spike in a wave. It's like someone took a bite out of all these bumps. So you have all these bumps with this big like chunk taken out. So that that's we don't think that's epileptic. We think that's just kind of a typical Angelman pattern. So if someone says, well, it's normal Angelman abnormalities, which sounds weird, normal abnormalities. but that's you know that's what it is. Um, so that's kind of a typical pattern, very common in Angelman, and we don't believe it's epileptic. Um, the rhythmic theta is a little bit tricky. I'm going to skip that. And the, this is the classic, the posterior notch delta. And so it's it's the same thing that we saw in the front, but it's this kind of classic, just real tall, um, tall waves in the back of the brain. Um, they can look kind of spiky. You can see a little bit of sharpness in there. But that's that that's present in, you know, between that and the, the frontal, it's present in like 95% of kids with Angelman syndrome, 96%. So um, they all have this kind of kind of signature on their EEG. So, um, and that's what we have to be careful of because we've seen EEGs like this be read as, you know, occipital seizures coming on and on, but they're, they're, they're not. That's just the typical. And we don't really know the significance whether, I mean, it makes sense if you have less of it. Um, it's a better... Um, better prognosis developmentally if, you know, the, the kids with imprinting center defects really do have less of that than the kids with deletions. So there's probably something to it, but we don't think this increases the risk of seizure. If we, if, if we're, you know, if you don't see any seizures and we're just checking an EEG to make sure things are still all good and nothing's going on and we see a bunch of this, it, it's not worrisome as worse if we see clear spikes, that's when we say, okay, well, that's, that's more potential for seizure right there. So that's maybe something's not quite right. Um, so those are the those are the when when you hear people say like oh well, it's just Angelman stuff like that's what they're talking about and um, and it's important to differentiate that between seizure activity it can go both ways you can sometimes think that's a seizure and it's not or you can actually see seizure and it's just called Angelman stuff so um, but it's not it's not easy I, I mean I've seen I don't know how many of these and I still there's still some that I stare at and I'm like ah, I think it's a seizure. not to inspire all you with confidence but but it, it's not always it's not always uh, it's not always easy um, you can usually figure it out but it's not always super clear. But in, in the end, the the key is always what what is what's the kid doing? You know, if they look great, then it's probably fine. You know, so that's that's really what it comes down to at the end. That the EG helps, but it's not the be all end all. It's it's you know, what do you see in front of you? How are they doing? If they're doing great, then then we're doing stuff right. If they're not doing great, um, no matter what the EG says, something needs to be fixed. Um, so non-epileptic myoclonus. This is. Um, for those who were here this morning, we talked about this. Um, we did a study in 2010 that was published last year, um, looking at adults. Um, Anna Larson, who was a research assistant with us, is now a resident at Mass General, and hopefully will be staying with us to do more Angelman stuff. She um, uh, she did a big survey, looked at a, um, 110 um, did 110 phone interviews for um, parents and caregivers of adults with Angelman, and um, one of the things that kept kind of popping up was. Um, these myoclonic events, so a lot of 
people called them seizures, other people said they weren't seizures, but the thing was the same, it was just these big long twitching events that popped up after puberty. And so, so we started looking more at that and what we saw in clinic is people were coming to clinic with the same kind of thing, weren't sure what to do with it, weren't sure if it was seizure, not seizure. Um, just to kind of differentiate in, um, in, uh, in Angelman, so myoclonic seizures, as we talked about, about 40% of kids will have myoclonic seizures. Um, real common in Angelman syndrome, often the first seizure type that, that pops up. And uh, the events are quick, though. They're, they're usually seconds. Um, they're, uh, like I said, there's these kind of brief, um, quick jerks. Um, and then if, if you happen to be, have an EEG on what happens, you'll see a big burst of spike and wave on the EEG when it happens. And, um, uh, and like I mentioned before, the non-progressive myoclonic status and non-progressive encephalopathies, um, that presents with myoclonic jerking, but loss of skills, regression, the whole bit. Um, and that's, that's, um, that's really distinct. What we were seeing in older individuals was that these started later. They, they weren't in childhood, but they were um, at the onset of puberty or later. Um, it would last seconds to hours. And, uh, um, but what we see is there's no, typically no significant alteration in consciousness. Um, uh, they're, they're, it's not quite right because they're, they're shaking, but, um, but they can communicate, they can answer, they can nod yes or no when you ask them questions. Um, they can eat, they can drink, a lot of them can go to the bathroom. So they, they still kind of do their skills, but depending how severe it is, it's either just annoying or it can be really um, a big uh, quality of life issue. It can actually be so shaky that it prevents you from doing all that stuff that you want to do, like eat and drink and go to the bathroom. So, um, so it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's an issue. And then um, we see no, no regression or loss of skills. We can see someone do this for five hours, um, pop out of it, and then just go right back to what they were doing and have just a nice normal evening like they always do. So um, if it was a seizure, you wouldn't see that. And then we, um, at, at, at our hospital specifically, had two people come in for monitoring, and, and they had these events, and the EEG was totally not normal, but it was, it was their typical EEG while it was happening. Um, you know, we didn't see those changes that you would see during a myoclonic seizure. Another, another six adults that we follow, we were, you know, same thing, um, no correlation on the EEG. Um, so when we looked at the folks we have at, uh, at Mass General who were 13 and up, 7% um, began um, at age 11 to 15, um, another 11 at age 18 to 25, so there's a couple different time points. The, the, ones, um, the, the, the ones under 20 all had short events. The ones who were over 20, um, six out of the 14 had longer events lasting an hour or more. Um, as long as five, you know, five six hours, they can, they can really be long events. The um, uh, distribution was pretty, pretty standard as, you know, um, deletions, UB3, UPD, we saw these events in all of them. Um, we didn't see any in anyone with imprinting centers, but I think, we, I think we follow five kids with imprinting center defects, and they're all under 10, so you know, we don't, we don't know, but um, that, that is the mildest phenotype, so I wouldn't be surprised if none of them had it, but that's, that's something we'll hopefully find out. Um, so, um, and like I said, we, you know, we, checked, the, we checked the EGs. Um, the, uh, um, the myoclonus um, was uh, maybe 30% in those in the teen years, and then it was closer to 50% in the 20 to 35, and the 35 and up, so um, it, it it looks like it's a little more common in the older folks, but we don't know if that's a curve that's gonna kinda keep going, or if it's just that kinda starts, you know, either at 10 or 20, and then that's that's final. But um, what we talked about this morning was that I don't think it's degenerative in some, in some neurologic, um, uh, you know, syndromes, we see that, you know, myoclonus shows up as the brain's deteriorating and getting worse, and you see all this twitching, and as just things go worse, 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 you see more twitching. But the, you know, the ones who are 40 and twitching, um, they look amazing, they walk, they communicate, they, they, they look fantastic. So I, just based on that small sample, my gut tells me that it's not, and nothing's getting worse, it's just part of the movement disorder. It's, you know, they have tremor and imbalance when they're younger, when they get older, it's more of the myoclonic type stuff, but I, I really think it is just, um, part of the movement disorder and not a sign that things are getting worse. Um, so, and I think that was it. We're gonna talk about treatments next, but um, that's, our, that's our group at Mass General. Um, uh, as you see, the, all, all the different specialties, and, um, and I think that's it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, I think we have a microphone, yeah. Sure. Could I just ask for your comments on something that came out of the scientific forum yesterday about yeah. some of the speakers didn't like midazolam for emergency care. Yeah. And so in a situation where someone, my son, is, is full, 
reasonably controlled on a combination of epilim and lavictal. If he has a tonic-clonic, the treatment of choice at the moment is the injection of 5 to 10 milligrams of midazolam yeah. uh, anally or, or in the mouth. Um, what I heard yesterday is that's not a desirable treatment anymore. What would you yeah. um, say in general? I know you can't specifically right, right, right. recommend yeah. for the emergency tonic-clonic treatment. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, that, that did come up. Um, one of those speakers mentioned that, but t to be honest, and I've, I've talked to some of the other folks that were there, I've I've never heard that. I I don't think that's accurate. Um, you know, it sounded like it was data from ICUs, but if someone's in an ICU anyway, they're probably something bad happened so yeah, I mean my, my guess is that that's not I mean I don't want to I don't know I don't know what study they're referring to but I heard the same thing but I that's not that's not something I know of and I know our ICU uses midazolam all the time every kid so I really don't think midazolam is an issue but that is a great point it was raised yesterday and and um, I, I talked to a bunch of people last night and said did you have you ever heard of this and it's like no so um, but the, the other thing too is like when it's used in the ICU it's often used for a month, you know, some people are on it for, you know, if they go into status or on it for a month, and yeah, they're not going to do well because they were in a coma for a month. But I don't think I don't think it was the medicine. So, um, as as far as far as I know, from just what we know, I, I don't think midazolam is a problem. But it's a great question. I th yeah, that, I saw that too, and I was like, I don't I don't think that's the case. Yeah, and and just in general for um, for acute stopping, the the benzos are the first line because they work really fast. So whether it's midazolam, which is not available in the U.S. now, but it's hopefully close uh, nasally, um, rectally or nasally, um, or it's uh, diazepam, which is uh, can come rectally. It's diastat or um, Ativan comes in like a little real super concentrated liquid. You can just put like a drop in the cheek. So um, any of the benzos, however you can get them into somebody, whether it's rectally, orally, um, nasally, uh, those are still the, the the treatment of choice for to stop a seizure or, or, or a bad or a bad tremor. Yeah. Hi. Hey. My daughter is um, 19 and she's on Depakote and mm -hmm. Zorotin. Um, she has a little hand tremor sometimes. Is that the Depakote side effect? That's a, that's a good question. That's not always easy to figure out. So one of the, it's not 100%, but one of the best, um, one of the best ways we kind of figure out in clinic, if you start to see the tremor, um, immediately kind of hold her hand and 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 see and if and if it stops that's more likely to be a tremor more likely to be depakote if you still feel no matter how hard you hold it you still feel twitching and it's you know then that's um that's more likely to be a little myoclonic tremor and and the most common place it starts is in the hands and we have lots of lots of folks that it's just in their hands and it's not severe enough to interfere with anything so we don't treat those um if it's not bothering people we don't treat um so if if, if you see that and you feel it and you just feel it's still twitching no matter how hard you hold you can still feel the twitching it's probably more the myoclonus and if it's mild enough not to bugger then you know we typically don't don't treat it we just kind of keep an eye and make sure it doesn't get worse and then when she falls asleep at night um, she just falls asleep and then she twitches and wakes up yep. over and over and yeah. over for yeah. hours. Yeah. And then she oh. finally seems to fall asleep. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a great question and actually that's something I probably should have talked about. Um, so, uh, like I mentioned, any of you that fell asleep during this, I don't blame you. It's, um, but if you did and you twitched, uh, that's, that's what we call sleep myoclonus, we all have it. Um, but Kids with angel tend to have exaggerated sleep myoclonus, so lots of kids just twitch a lot during the night, and the most common times are as you're falling asleep, right before you wake up. So that's 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 normal sleep type stuff. But um, if it's really severe um, and to the point where it may actually like stop you from falling asleep, um, well, two things. One, sometimes we just treat that, like we'll do a little bit of dose of something at night to try to quiet that sleep myoclonus, um, really for symptomatic, just so we can get them to sleep and get good quality sleep. But on the other end, it's like the chicken and the egg. The uh, the reason that it usually gets bad is because it's an indicator of poor sleep. So, if if we see if even because you don't you don't just stay up all night and watch kids sleep, you don't know exactly what's going on. So if if you notice that at the beginning of the night there's more sleep myoclonus, you know you don't see much, but then you see a bunch of it. Odds are that this that once they go to bed, you go to bed. That there's there's waking, there's like lower quality sleep. So it's often an indicator that that sleep is not fantastic at that point so um, sometimes you just treat it sometimes you know if we get the sleep as good as we can but if we can't sometimes you have to treat that to get the so you have to treat the side effect of the poor sleep to make the sleep better which is awkward yeah yeah trazodone is great for sleep but it won't help the myoclonus so if um, but if whatever you can do to get her sleeping best the, the myoclonus should get better but if not in some kids when it hasn't gotten better we've actually done a little dose of something at night to try to quiet it but it's 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 not an exact science <laughs> but it's it's but, but when you see that only going to sleep and then it finally settles it's it's 
most likely to be, you can't say 100%, but it's most likely to be sleep myoclonus. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I um, have four angels and <laughs> my youngest angel, <laughs> wow. specifically I have a question about. Yeah. Um, she had blood work done and her, she came back with a CDKL5 gene disorder. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Because she basically was diagnosed with reflex seizures and currently she's 13. All of yeah. the other angels kind of are fitting with what you're saying. They're getting better or they're yeah. staying the same, but she gets the myoclonic, yeah. the drop, the status. Did, did, did she, did she have a positive genetic test for angel men or was it clinical? It's the UB3 a UB3A and CDKL5? Yes. Wow. Um, that I've never seen. Um, really? So, so, well, not that I've, ne well, I've never seen them together. <laughs> never seen them together. But what's Yeah, I, ha I brought the paperwork because wow. I would never remember. Yeah, yeah. And no. uh, oh. it's a currently a problem, and I th was yeah. kind of excited to see you because I know I've heard that you're a seizure expert. Yeah. And our seizure doctor, he's been really good about communicating but right now she's on uh, Depakote, Lamitrigrin, wow. um, yeah. Zorontin, and um, Keppra, Lamitrigrin, Zorontin, oh. and Depakote. Yeah. What, what did they say about the CDKL5? Well, they basically said that that's probably why she has yeah. so many problems with her seizures yeah. and we're just constantly trying to get them controlled. And I didn't know yeah. with your study if you had this kind of issue with any of your other no well people. I mean that's a great question so the um, you know when when kids are clinically diagnosed and there's not that UB3A diagnosis the question is always well is it really angel men or is it something that looks like it and and there's a list of disorders that look like angel men so um, you know Pitt Hopkins is one Rett syndrome is a biggie but CDKL5 is um, uh, it's its own thing now but they used to call it atypical Rett's so it's it's actually its own genetic disorder that kind of looks like Angelman and, and can have really tough seizures associated with it. So if, um, I'm not a geneticist, so you know, I know some mutations or deletions or whatever, they, they, I understand the Angelman part, but for the other ones, so if it's a CDKL5 that's not causing problems, um, I don't know if that's a thing, but if it really is a true CDKL5, it's actually two neurogenetic disorders in the same kid, which makes things really complicated. Yeah, because the blood work came back both yeah. Positive for so if that so if that's the case, a lot of what I just said probably won't apply because the CDKL5 brings a whole new, um, a whole new realm of 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 stuff. And um, uh, and not to get into a CDKL5 lecture, but uh, it, the epilepsy is, is difficult, and a lot of times, for the kids that we see, we often go to diet therapy because the medicines typically don't work. Um, so if you get to the point where, so if you actually have three, wow, well, four kids with, so if you have three kids with Angelman syndrome who are doing well, seizure, yeah, but three who are doing well. <laughs> and then and then a fourth who's really struggling and they have CDKL5, it's probably the CDKL5 that's causing the issues. And the epilepsy should be treated more as if it's a CDKL5 type of epilepsy, which is, and often we just don't get good luck with the drugs. And But we've had really good luck with diet therapy with, with a few kids with CDKL5, so that's definitely something I would ask your doctors about. We've had really good luck with diet therapy with CDKL5 kids, so. Um, so, yeah, yeah. In your last lecture, you were talking a little bit about the GI issues. My yeah. son started Zonagran, and then all of a sudden started having some gagging and like almost like barf burp type situations. Yeah. Is it a side effect of the Zonagran, or do you think it just kind of started with that? Um, and then how would you treat the GI issues? It's a good question. <laughs> um, so I would I would say maybe, <laughs> but so any any seizure medicine can cause other issues and um, uh, reflux can be. Um, but there's there's some of the some of the medicines can have some GI-ish kind of side effects. Zonagran is one of them. It's not super common, but it it, it can be. Mm -hmm. So if there was a clear correlation, it could be. And the question so but then again, it's always risk benefit. If if the reflux is so bad that it's worth changing medicines, then we think about doing that. If the if the medicine's working fantastic, seizures are amazing, um, then you kind of just deal with it and treat the, the, the GI yeah. symptoms. So it just depends on, um, you know, if there's a clear correlation, then 
there's a decent chance that they are related. And then you just, you know, you have to take it, you know, if, if the Zion is kind of the first medicine and the seizures haven't been that bad, changing might be worth it. But if you've tried a bunch of stuff, nothing's worked, that one really nailed it, then, you know, you may want to just kind of treat the treat the side effects and say, okay, you know, we're going to deal with the Zonogram because it's really controlling the seizures, but we'll, um, you know, we'll uh, address the reflux too. But it could be, it could be a coincidence. It could okay. be just that yeah. reflux happened when that started, so. Yeah, we so, added the Zantac, but you just hate to. It's like yeah, you add one yeah, drug to then add exactly. another. Exactly. Yeah, so. and and that's the, that's the hard part is that it's always, you know, what what good can come of this, what bad can come of this, and if you think more good would come off of replacing it, then you do it. If you think that more bad would come from it, then you just kind of write it out and and deal with it. So it's um, but it, it's that it's that plus minus. But it could be whenever we think that a medicine is having side effects, that's always the question. Well, first question: Are they side effects? And sometimes you never know until you try coming off to see if they get better. But um, uh, but then it's always the plus minus. If you've tried everything, the seizures finally stopped. Sometimes it's best not to rock the boat and just to try to minimize the side effects with other stuff. If you know seizures have been great and that just happens to be the medicine at the time, it may be worth you know switching it out for something else that may not cause it. The other thing with Zonogran is every now and then we check blood levels for um, electrolytes because Zonogran can lower your acid base levels. And if the if that level is low, it can make you nauseous. Um, so that's with Zonogram, whenever we hear GI and Zonogram, we always check a, a set of electrolytes because if, if the CO2 is low and they're acidotic from the Zonogram, um, that's easily fixed. Uh, you just do a little buffer supplement, it's real safe and easy. So that, so same with Topamax. When you hear Topamax, Zonogram, we hear GI, we always check the levels um, of uh, I guess that's for the next talk, but we always check the um, you know, CO2 levels because you can get acidotic, and if you can, it's easy to fix. So Great. Well, thank Everybody. you. Okay, sure. Um, my child is, I guess, a little bit different, maybe not quite as different as hers, yeah. um, but I kind of have, um, I guess, several questions and, and maybe oh, even a, a possibly a video. So I didn't know if there was a possibility you may be willing to um, talk to me afterwards or um, let me email you or something like that. Yeah, Is that a no, possibility? I'll, be, I'll be around today, yeah. Okay, perfect, yeah. thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'm kind of, I don't know, my son always seems, seems to be the odd one, but we seem to be experiencing focal, um, mm -hmm. partial, whatever, we've yeah. heard all that's, those terms. That's, that's legal. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, but nothing is ever caught on anything. Can't catch it on camera, can't catch it on EEG, MRIs, yeah. anything like that. Um, and they're changing as he's entering in puberty part, you know, stages of things. Yeah. Um, and they're not changing better, you know, like where you had talked about a little bit. Yeah. Um, so my question to you is kind of one of those, we're at this medicate, don't medicate phase, um, cause we have not been, cause they've been just very few and far between. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. so my question to you is how do we know? And the other, like know if it is truly focal and not generalized and know because we're not being able to see it on an EEG. Yeah. Um, and then also to know we see a, what appears to be an absence. I never say it right. Um, yeah. You know, with it. So can they come together like that? I mean, he seems to be aware that they're coming. They know he preferred, non-preferred yeah. on roller skates will happen, you know. Um, and mm -hmm. then what about GABA supplements? Oh, supplements. No, uh, yeah. so the, um, no, it's a great question. So, um, so for one of the questions, whether it's focal or generalized, um, like it matters to, you know, nerds like us, but it, in, in reality, it, it doesn't matter so much. Uh, it's the same medicine. So in, in the, in the, in the, the overall epilepsy world, there's medicines like you know, Trileptal, Tegretol, those kind of medicines that are really meant for focal seizures. And so you could use those, but if you use those in angel and syndrome, you're gonna worsen them whether they're, so, cause even, if they're, even though they're focal seizures, you need a generalized drug to treat them. So, um, so as far as trying to figure out which one it is, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but it's you know it's the, the question is are they seizures or are they not seizures? And if you're pretty convinced they're seizures, then the question is do you treat them or do you not treat? Them? I mean they're not they're not easy questions. But um, the the general versus focal, um, you know, like I said, probably doesn't matter. And if they um, if they're not catching a lot of spike and wave on the EEGs in between seizures, they're likely to be focal. Um, but then that's the question of of treating and the. Um, you know, we always, you know, some people think, okay, you treat every seizure always, you know, you, know, they, you can't have any. But then some people are like, well, you know, I'm kind of in the middle. If, if they're rare and there's medicine side effects, you know, can you get away with a few? I, I, you know, I think it's okay sometimes. But um, the, the, the big question I think would be safety. So if he skateboards and does all this cool stuff, you know, if he has one, you don't want him falling. So that's, that's one thing to really think about when you come to that decision on, um, on uh, whether or not to treat, it's it's not just the seizures themselves, but what what they can do. Um, and what was, what was that? There was another part of that. I've, the, um, 
I already lost my train of thought. Oh, no, yeah. Uh, the, well, it, that pretty much kind of, you answered it all, I think, with the, yeah. the, but then the GABA supplements. Oh, the GABA supplements, supplements yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's a good question. So in, in, in supplements in general, um, it's, it's tough. It, it, we, we, there's, no, there's no right or wrong answer. So basically, for most supplements, they're not FDA regulated, so there's not good data. Are they safe? Are they useful? Are they whatever? But there's a bunch that we just know from being used over time that are that are, are, are okay. And um, the GABA ones, uh, you know, we think they're okay. We're not sure. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. The, um, uh, you know, this, some of the stuff that, you know, that we see is like probiotics. Um, our dietitian uses them all the time. We are big probiotic fans. Um, if you use fish oil, there's never a downside to fish oil, really. Um, it's, uh, it's natural. Um, you know, vitamins at the right doses, you know, not crazy amounts of vitamins. Um, uh, magnesium supplements can be really good for constipation. So there's definitely supplements that we know are good that we recommend. There's other ones that kind of make us nervous. Um, GABA is one that we just don't know a lot about. So if that helps. <laughs> so it's not a yes, it's not a no. It's kind of like we just don't know that much. But 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 GABA is what is in the drugs that we use that help seizures, that help sleep, that helps. So we think GABA is good. It's just a question of if it's unregulated, do we know exactly what's in it? There's, um, I was telling someone at the scientific convention, there was somebody that was not at our hospital, but we just, you know, it was, it was a big a big deal. It was, um, they were using this uh, this herbal supplement. It was like a Chinese herbal supplement that they had gotten. And um, and it was helping their kids sleep, but it was really making them very sleepy. And, and the family actually brought it somewhere and had it tested. There's phenobarbital in it. So you gotta really be careful with, uh, that's the thing with supplements, you never know what's in them. Um, so if it's something that you know is safe, you can trust, you know where it comes from, it's probably okay, but it's not always okay. So it's in supplements in general, you just have to be careful. And if there's any question, just ask your doctors. We usually, well, we'll either say, yes, do it, no, don't do it, or I don't know, and at least, that, at least that, that's helpful. But I would always ask, um, it, it just really, because um, some are great, some are not great, and then there's some that we just don't know. And I think it's helpful to know whether we think they're good, bad, or, or unknown, yeah. Okay, thanks, yeah.